welcome everyone online and here in the room to the support of Professor Sandy Pepper's latest book, If You're So Ethical, Why Are You So Highly Paid? I'm Elizabeth Stamen. Before we start, let me highlight some practicalities. If there is a fire alarm signal, please leave the building promptly and keep your way to the fire assembly point, which is in Lincoln's infield. Please put your mobile phone on silent to avoid disrupting the event. This event is being recorded. A podcast might be made available online. There's also a Twitter hashtag for the event, which should be available somewhere behind me, I hope, or on screen. So Sandy will give an introduction to the book. Then we'll have a panel discussion and we'll finish up with a Q&A um, aiming to be finished by 8 p.m. As I mentioned, this is a hybrid event, so we have people both in the room and online. Apparently about 250 online, which is brilliant. If there are any sound issues online, please let us know and someone from the events team can pick this up. So let me briefly introduce myself. I'm an external member of the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee, or the FPC. The FPC was created after the 2008 financial crisis. I'm also an external member of the Bank of England's Financial Market Infrastructure Board. Prior to that, I worked as a senior advisor to the Prudential Regulation Authority, which is the supervisory arm of the Bank of England, focusing on governance across the UK financial services sector. In addition, I'm a non-executive member on boards of companies both in the UK and in Germany. This includes being the chair of Edinburgh Investment Trust, a FTSE 250 listed investment trust, and a member of the supervisory board of German real estate company Alstra AG. I'm also an external member of the Audit and Risk Committee of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or AIIB. And I'm a fellow of Chapter Zero, the UK chapter of the Climate Governance Initiative, which provides a knowledge base for non-executive directors on climate issues. Prior to this, I was the Global Chief Operating Officer for LaSalle Investment Management, having previously worked at Morgan Stanley for over 20 years, actually starting there just after graduating from the LSE. In these roles, I've worked at a range of publicly listed public sector and not-for-profit organizations. It is in a personal capacity that I chair this event tonight. I'm especially glad to be here at the LSE as I studied here, and given that I've been involved with the LSE for many years. Most recently, and I still am, as a member of council and as a member of the LSE Finance and Estates Committee, so Alex and I were on the committee together and I met Sandy first about 10 years ago on the audit committee. So let me introduce the panelist. Catherine Griffiths um, at the very end is currently the finance editor at Bloomberg Business. She's previously worked as the Telegraph and the Times where she was the banking editor. Eva Mitchell next to her is professor at law here at the LSE. At the law school, she's focusing on corporate law and on securities law. Her most recent book, published in 2021, is called Company Law, A Real Entity Theory. And we have Alex Verhoeve, a professor in the Department of Philosophy, actually head of department, you taught me now, Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method here at the LSE. He's held visiting positions at Harvard, Princeton, and the National Institute of Health in the US. His re research covers decision, theory, moral th psychology, and distributive justice, which is very topical for tonight. And then of course, Professor Sandy Pepper. Sandy is the Emeritus Professor of Management Practice at the LSE, where he has been teaching and researching since 2008. Prior to this, he had a long career at PwC or PricewaterhouseCoopers, why he was global head of, H, of the HR services consulting, consulting practice. Sandy is one of the UK's recognized experts on executive pay and has written widely on the subject in the academic and practitioner press. His books include 
the economic psychology of incentives and agency theory and executive pay. We are here tonight to talk about Sandy's latest book, If You're So Ethical, Why Are You So Highly Paid? This is both a very important and a very timely subject. The pandemic has particularly shone a light on the S in ESG. Companies, their investors and other stakeholders are increasingly focused on well-being and social elements of the workforce and the ethics of the business they work with. At the same time, the rising cost of living is increasing the emphasis on pay awards and there's likely to be significant scrutiny on salary increases and bonuses for senior management. By co coincidence, I attended a presentation for non-executive directors by one of the large consulting firms recently, where they presented the results of a business survey, which found over 75% of survey respondents have already made or are considering making significant cost of living interventions out of round pay uplifts, for example, and of the 33, percent that have already intervened, 50% were considering additional support. Amongst other things, the survey also showed some redistribution of pay budgets with a shift in spend from higher paid workers, such as senior executives, to lower paid workers, and those lowest in their relevant pay band. The survey showed that there has been a decline in proportion of senior management receiving a pay freeze. In 2022, 15% of C CEOs received no increases versus 43% in 2021. But 56% of companies awarded CEOs pay increases in line with a wider workforce, whereas 38% awarded an increase below that of the wider workforce. So when asked, are higher executive salary increases appropriate when aligned to the workforce? 34% of investors think executive director salary increases should be below the workforce. However, there was a preference overall for boards determining executive pay in the context, context of companies' needs. <coughs> so some interesting statistics here drawing out some of the messaging around ethics in, of pay in Sandy's book. I will pause, pass over to Sandy to speak further about the subject and uh, some of these themes and add what he's found on executive beliefs and pay inflation. So Sandy, over to you. I don't know why I brought the book, so I don't have time to read it. But um, <laughs> uh, So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for coming out on a wet evening when Wales are playing football. Um, uh, I imagine there are no Welsh people in the audience this evening. Um, one of my old friends used to be the head of the pre-prep department of an independent boys' school. She is an innovative and inspirational teacher. And she ran a philosophy club for boys aged six and seven, which I had the great privilege to go and talk to on a number of occasions. Um, she did this to introduce them, as she called it, to the joys of philosophizing. So they would meet for an hour after school, uh, they would drink robust tea and eat hobnobs, and they would talk about significant matters like uh, the significance of names, um, optical illusions and whether robots can think. So one day Mrs. Taylor, for that is her name, said to the philosophy club, um, I want you to imagine that we are a pirate band and that we've just found a huge cache of treasure. Now I am the captain, so I get half the treasure and you have to decide how to allocate the rest. So the boys discussed whether to share their half proportionately in proportion to their grades in class or perhaps how good they were at football 
but eventually they decided they would split it equally, the egalitarian option. And after this lesson in distributive justice, all seemed well, but then one little boy said, uh, please, Mrs. Taylor, why do you get half the treasure? <laughs> now, some of you, um, especially if you happen to have read The Guardian two weeks ago, may have heard this story already. Uh, but I rather like it because I think it neatly illustrates a question that has troubled me for a long time. Is it fair that some people appear to obtain a disproportionate share of society's income and wealth? So this question has become one of the defining issues of our age, um, stated, I think, most clearly by Thomas Piketty in his book, Capital in the 21st Century. And my own research has focused on senior executive pay, the people that Thomas Piketty describes as super managers. Um, there's a coda to this story on the pirate's treasure, which I have time, I will come back to later. So a few years ago, over cups of coffee with my colleague Suzanne Barry, a moral philosopher, uh, and separately with Tom Gosling, who was then head of senior executive reward consulting at PwC, we decided to find out what super managers themselves thought about high pay and distributive justice. The proposition I'm going to advance in the next few minutes is that senior executives are not, in the main, the self-interested ethical egoists of popular culture. Some are, but most are not. Instead, they are the most fortunate beneficiaries of a market failure. When it comes to top pay for too long, companies have behaved as if they were in the equivalent of an arms race. And I believe that um, the, the system is broken uh, and if executive pay is to be brought under control, something needs to change. So before I talk about the, the study, let me provide some context. And on the principle that a picture, or at least a chart is worth many words, I'm going to show you five graphs. So this is one of Thomas Piketty's charts. It shows the proportion of income each year, uh, earned each year in the United States and the United Kingdom by the top 1% of the population. So at the beginning of the 20th century, a time uh, sometimes described as the Gilded Age, the top 1% commanded uh, nearly 20% of total income in both the US and the UK. By 1975, it had reduced to 10% in the US and 7% in the UK. And in the 1980s, the top 1% share began to rise once again. By 1990, some commentators were talking about a second gilded age. And at the, the end of the 20th century, the top percentile share of income in the US was approaching levels it had reached at the start of the century, and the UK was not far behind. Now, Thomas Piketty attributes this, in part at least, to the rise in the pay of super managers. And this slide shows the total remuneration of CEOs of FTSE 100 companies, and it shows how it has risen very rapidly since 1980, from £75,000 in 1980, about 330000 in today's terms, uh, to over £4.5 in 2015. The chart shows that pay took a dip during the COVID-19 pandemic, but recent data from PwC and the High Pay Centre shows that top pay is now returning to pre-pandemic levels. But this is, of course, nothing uh, when we can make comparisons with the United States. This graph shows the, the US Fortune 350 figures um, rising from 2.5 million in 1980 to over $20 million in 2008 before the start of the global financial crisis. And again, it took a dip, um, but is uh, uh, by um, 2021 almost back to the levels it was at in 2015. Now, this slide shows the ratio of CEO pay to national average earnings in the US and the UK. So it's the ratio of top pay to average earnings. Uh, in 1980, UK top managers earned around 18 times national average earnings. And in the US, the figure was just under 40 times. 
Immediately before the COVID pandemic in 2020, the figure was around 150 times in the UK and over 300 times in the US. One of the standard arguments of the defenders of very high executive pay is that it's related to company financial performance, consistent with Milton Friedman's mantra that the purpose of a company is to maximize shareholder value. So this graph um, is, shows the, the FTSE 100 share price index, um, that's the, the red line, um, and an index of CEO pay uh, uh, dating back to 1983 when the FT uh, 100 was, was first formed. And what you see is that the two, uh, the two indices tracked each other quite well until around 2006. And then uh, CEO pay uh, took off significantly compared with what was happening with the FTSE 100 in index. And even though they, they join at the time of the pandemic, the two lines have started to separate again since then. So that's enough pay data. Let me turn instead to the ethics of high pay and to the empirical study uh, on what business executives think about distributive justice, which lies at the heart of this research. This is a study that I carried out with two academic colleagues, Suzanne Berry and Daniel, Daniela Loop, who both have historical connections with the LSE, and also with the help of um, PwC, uh, particularly Tom Gosling, Adam Bassett, Jason Bawanabala, and Simon Hunt. And like Mrs. Taylor's philosophy class, it began with a thought experiment, a standard tool in the philosopher's toolbox. <laughs> So John Rawls, one of the most famous philosophers, moral philosophers of the 20th century, used a thought experiment in his work on distributive justice. He postulated what he called the original position in which no one knows their, their place in society, their class or their social status, nor does anyone know their, their fortune in terms of um, their endowment of natural assets, their, their intelligence, their strength and so forth. And in this position, behind what Rawls calls a veil of ignorance, he reasoned that the rational choice would be to prefer a scheme of distributive justice, which he calls the difference principle. The fairest system is one which maximizes the welfare of the worst off members of society. And under this system, incentives and differential incomes are permitted, but only if they are necessary to permit to, to maximize the welfare of the worst off. There's no particular ethical merit, the argument goes, in everyone being equally poor if differential distribution could lead to an improvement in the welfare of the least fortunate. So for our study, Suzanne and I designed a questionnaire in which we invited business executives to, to think themselves into the original position and then to express how they felt about six different principles of distributive justice. Did they uh, strongly agree? Did they agree? Did they uh, disagree or strongly disagree that communities and companies in which, each of, in which each of these principles would embedded would be a just society? And we also asked them to rank the importance of the six different <clears throat> principles. So as well as John Rawls' difference principle, um, or maximin, as we called it, we chose to examine five other principles of distributive justice. Dessert assumes that it's fair that people who contribute the most should receive more than those who contribute less. What we earn should in some way be proportionate to our contribution. Equal opportunity is what it says on the tin. Everyone should have equal access to positions with, which come with economic advantages. <laughs> Sufficiency is the principle that all members of society should have an income that is sufficiently high to lead a dignified life. The entitlement principle, first articulated by John Rawls' colleague, the Harvard philosopher Robert Nozick, uh, is that any income which someone voluntarily pays to someone else is just, even if some people become inordinately wealthy as a result. And finally, efficiency associated with the Canadian philosopher Joseph Heath assumes that the, the, the right distribution of income 
is the one that leads to an efficient allocation of labor. So for any economists in the audience, Heath's argument is that if general equilibrium theory is uh, uh, critical to maintaining an efficient economy, then it should be a normative ethical principle as well as a positive economic principle. So our survey was issued to a large sample of super managers from around the world. We gather data from over 1100 senior executives working in over 20 countries and more than 25 different industries. Approximately two thirds of them were men and one third were women. And we carried out a battery of statistical tests on the resulting data. So it was evident from the results of our analysis that executives appear to take <coughs> distributive justice very seriously. Uh, they engaged with the process. Um, they told us anecdotally about the amount of time that it had taken them to digest the questions and reflect on their answers. They agreed or strongly agreed with more <laughs> principles of justice than they disavowed. And the narrative comments that many of them provided were very consistent with this uh, idea that a serious ethical perspective on pay and inequality was being taken. Our first most striking observation was the pronounced degree of pluralism. So par participants indicated that they believed in the truth of a number of different principles of distributive justice. Over 90% of respondents agreed with more than one justice principle and more than 50% subscribed to uh, four or more principles. Uh, pluralism was relatively homogeneous across demographic, demographic factors such as gender, nationality, and industry sector. So many philosophers have assumed that it only makes sense to have one distributive justice system um, that, that, that uh, a philosopher can properly in, endorse. Others argue that pluralism is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, for example, the prominent American political theorist Michael Walzer, an influential in an influential book entitled Spheres of Justice, says that no single distributive justice criterion can possibly match the diversity of social goods. An Oxford philosopher, David Miller, argues that principles of justice must be understood contextually, depending on different forms of human association and reflecting the complexity of modern society. So the results of our survey coalesced into four distinct groups or clusters, which we labeled welfare liberals, relational egalitarians, meritocrats, and free marketeers. So welfare liberals down in the, uh, the southwest corner uh, believe that people should be rewarded for the contribution that they make to their communities with a view to making the worst off as well off as possible. All members of a community should have an income that is sufficient for them to lead a dignified life. You'll note the ties in the diagram to desert, maximum and sufficiency. Uh, when it comes to welfare liberals. And, and welfare liberals say things like, I agree with the principle that guarantees the welfare of all in society without exception, thinking about the dignity of people, including the most disadvantaged. But we must al also recognize the importance of freedom of choice, equal opportunities and encouraging talent. We need all of these things. Relational egalitarians believe that all members of a community should have an income that is sufficient for them to lead a dignified life. Talent, effort and contribution are not the only criteria for allocating economic benefits. And you'll note the ties on the diagram uh, here to e uh, e equality of opportunity uh, and sufficiency. So the relational egalitarians are in the, the southeast corner of the diagram. And they say things like a society in which wage inflation can be greater than savings potential on minimum wages will never be just. We need a method that can address this, uh, which makes property and wealth accumulation more uh, accessible objectives for all. Meritocrats, somewhere in the Midlands, um, meritocrats think that people deserve uh, to receive economic benefits principally because of their efforts or the demands of their jobs. And they say things like, all people should have 
opportunities in the job market equally, but their appointment should depend solely on their efforts and not on external influences. People should be promoted on merit. But note also that they still subscribe to the sufficiency principle that everybody is entitled to have enough to lead a dignified life. Uh, and lastly, the free marketeers uh, in the top northwest corner, they argue that talented people deserve to receive the greatest economic benefits. Efficiency is the main criterion for determining how income should be allocated. And they say things like, let free markets reign. We want a society where people are free to win according to their skills, their abilities, their efforts, and their contributions. We must accept that in such a society, there will be some losers. So while the relation egalitarians were a slightly smaller group than the others, um, uh, the other three, crust three clusters were a broadly equal size, each with just over 300 members. And so we concluded that senior executives are not in the main the greedy ethical e egoists of popular culture. Certainly it's true that many of them, especially the free marketeers, believe that it's perfectly ethical to allow markets to determine economically efficient outcomes. And most, especially the meritocrats, believe that it's quite proper to reward people differentially, having regard to their effort, to their ability, and to the demands of the job. Many, including meritocrats, relational egalitarians, and welfare liberals, believe in the principle of sufficiency, that in a civilized society, everyone has the right to an income that is sufficient to, a to lead a dignified life. And that companies, not just governments, have responsibilities in this respect. Some, notably the welfare liberals, subscribe to the Rawlsian difference principle, maximin, that differential incomes can only be justified to the extent that this is necessary to maximize the welfare of the worst off members of society. But very few of our um, participants subscribed to entitlement theory, which justifies extraordinary differences in income and wealth on the basis of self-ownership and property rights. Which brings me to the question became, which became the title of the book, If You're So Ethical, Why Are You So Highly Paid? Um, for the philosophers in the audience, um, this is a riff on the title of a book by um, a political philosopher, Jerry Cohen, if you're an egalitarian, how come you're so rich? But he was an American, so I've changed the grammar. Um, <laughs> which, so what explains the, uh, the inflation in supermanager pay that we've seen over the past 35 years? And the answer, I believe, lies in a misplaced confidence in the efficiency of labour markets, a persuasive but ultimately flawed academic idea called agency theory, a poor, cho poor choice of mechanism design, notably the ubiquitousness of a particular type of long-term incentive plan. The rather ineffectual way politicians have responded to problems associated with high executive pay. Um, and I'm reminded of the words of Peter Mandelson, Lord Mandelson, a labor peer who once said, uh, we don't mind people getting filthy rich, I think he said, as long as they pay their taxes, um, which was a, a phrase he subsequently uh, came to regret. Um, a sociological concept called isomorphism, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, Whoop. and a prisoner's dilemma. Now, there's not time here for a detailed critique of past thinking about top pay, but I do want to say a few words about an alternative model which I call the market failure approach to executive pay. My clicker's not working. Oh, there we go. Um, the market failure approach to executive pay. So economists have known for a long time that labor markets are very different from commodity markets. Um, as Robert Solow, a Nobel Prize winning economist once put it, 
labor is not a commodity like fish. This is particularly true of super managers. Um, an efficient market requires many buyers and sellers, homogeneous products, or at least good substitutes, free market entry and exit, plentiful uh, information, uh, and little economic friction. And the problem with the market for top executives is that practically none of these conditions holds good. So the result is a market failure, uh, so that super manager wages are not uh, the market clearing wage. Because executive labor markets fail to provide effective price signals, the non-executive directors whose job is to determine the remuneration of top managers seek alternative ways of resolving the uncertainty which they face in deciding how to determine top pay. In 1983, two economic sociologists, Paul DiMaggio and Walter Powell, described how three isomorphic processes, as they called it, come to operate in response to such uncertainty. Isomorphism describes a, pro a process whereby social practices replicate and develop similar forms over time. So remuneration committees copy the pay strategies of other comparable organizations. This is known as mimetic isomorphism. Companies are constrained by laws and codes of practice established by government and regulators, and this is called coercive, coercive isomorphism. And they seek advice from remuneration consultants who benchmark pay data and recommend standard best practice solutions known as normative isomorphism. <clears throat> to make matters worse, when it comes to top pay, mimetic isomorphism leads to a prisoner's dilemma. So to illustrate, think about the market for CEOs of large companies. Assume for a moment that all CEOs are paid broadly equal amounts with only marginal variations in pay, justifiable, justified by reference to job size, industry, and specialist ex expertise. Assume also that in the available population of CEOs, 20% are superior to others and would, if they worked for your company, increase the value of the firm by more than average. 10%, uh, on the other hand, are inferior to the others and would, if you employed them, potentially reduce the firm's value. So if all companies offered moderate remuneration, then it would be in the interests of an individual company to defect and pay over the odds. By doing so, they might attract top talent uh, and they might be more successful than their competitors. Conversely, a company would not want to find itself in the position of paying significantly below average. To do so might mean it could only attract an inferior chief executive. Uh, executive. And no one is going to congratulate a, a company's remuneration committee for its financial prudence if the result is a second rate management. The result is that offering high, high salaries becomes the dominant strategy, even though by doing so, companies will generally be no better off than if they paid everybody moderate salaries. And I call this the, the remuneration committee's dilemma. So one of the most compelling frameworks for thinking about the moral obligations that private actors have towards each other in a market economy was articulated a few years ago by the Canadian philosopher Joseph Heath. The market failures approach to executive uh, to business ethics, as it's known, shows that a moral code can be developed from the basic idea that the fundamental obligation of managers is to ensure that markets operate efficiently. Market failures such as monopolies, oligopolies and cartels and negative externalities such as pollution and climate change become ethical issues. And again, for the economists in the audience, uh, stated formally, Heath's argument is, uh, that to, uh, to, is to make general equilibrium theory a normative ethical framework, as well as a, an economic theory. So there's, there's a lot more to the market failures approach to executive pay, but uh, there's not time to explain it here. Uh, so think about it as an incentive to read the book. Mm -hmm. Now, just before our discussion, let me say um, a few words about what political philosophers sometimes call Lenin's question, what is to be done? You will, I hope, have gathered by now that my thesis is that high pay 
for so-called super managers is, when all is said and done, an ethical problem. It's not just a technical matter for politicians, economists, and corporate governance specialists. So first, governments are ultimately responsible for ensuring that there is distributive justice in society. They must set the right moral tone, as well as appropriate policies on tax, disclosure, and corporate governance. Secondly, investors have a responsibility to steward their assets properly. Uh, this includes ensuring the executives who run their portfolio companies do not extract economic rents in the form of excessive pay. Third, companies have a responsibility to pay exec executives proportionately, to pay other employees appropriately, to provide all their workers with a living wage, and to manage intra-firm inequality. And finally, top executives must accept that there are ethical restrictions on their right to receive and retain excessive income. They owe this to their companies, to their peers, their colleagues, and to society as a whole. And finally, a coda. I said at the start that I would let the pirates have the final word. The American economist Peter Leeson has written a delightful book about the, the economics of pirating in the 18th century. What academics get up to. Um, he writes that at the end of a venture, um, a share of the plunder would first be offered to those who had lost limbs or suffered other major industries uh, while on the voyage. And the remainder of, the, uh, of, of the, the plunder was divided into lots, which were shared equally, except for the captain who got four times the average, the quartermaster who got double the average, and the ship's boys who just got a half share. It seems that the pirates of the Caribbean were a surprisingly egalitarian lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Um, a fascinating topic, um, especially given the interlink between business, philosophy, ethics, and economics, which I know all of management, all these things you've studied in the past. Uh, so some great data, excellent research. So um, let me just um, throw a few questions at the panel and then we'll go to the Q&A. So let me um, start by asking everyone on the panel. So what did you find most surprising when you read the book? So um, perhaps Catherine, if I can start with you. Um, I found it a little bit surprising having dealt with a fair few people in the world of business over the years that people were moved to um, emphasize their kind of interest in social justice. I find on the whole, um, as a terrible generalization, people in the world of business, and I write about banking mainly, um, they, they're fairly keenly motivated by um, their own pay. So I, I found that an interesting um, result from the book. Eva? Yeah, so I, I would say the, um, the most surprising insight from the book was the extent of the market failure. Um, so, that, so that clashed with a lot of the mainstream legal corporate governance literature that is very firmly rooted in the belief that there is a market here that is working. So I found that quite interesting, yeah. And Alex, as a philosopher? Uh, yeah, so I was um, perhaps not surprised, but uh, it was very interesting to read how many of your executives uh, endorsed, I mean, almost universally, some form of, some notion of sufficiency, right? Uh, and in addition, how many still endorse some uh, attenuated form of egalitarianism? I thought that was that was very striking. I do have a question to follow that up on with, though. And it was also especially striking that so few uh, endorsed entitlement theory. Basically, the the idea that anything goes when you between consenting adults, right? Um, uh, so long as I hold uh, legitimately hold a share of resources I'm permitted to give it all to Sandy and if everyone else does so as well, uh, the resulting inequalities are not problematic. It was astonishing to me that in the graph we saw there, uh, none of the executives ended up there. And I have a, I'd like 
to hear your view on why, I have a hypothesis. I may share it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> which is, you ask them a question that people who endorse the entitlement theory think is the wrong question to elicit their theory of justice. So you ask them the question, what if you did not know your talents and abilities and were behind the kind of Rawlsian veil of ignorance? What type of rules for the organization of society would you want for yourself in ignorance? But of course, holders of the entitlement theory like Robert Nozick deny that that is the right question to elicit the correct theory of justice. So my, here's the challenge to you, is the finding, which I find so surprising, not an artifact of the way you phrase the question? Might, if you'd asked them outright, what do you believe is the correct principle of justice, rather than asking them to do the thought experiment, might you have found, might you not have found a much higher proportion of people in that part of your graph? Allow me to answer. Briefly, yeah. Um, <clears throat> So the, the trouble with any data is you can start off by kind of denying the data. Um, I mean, the findings are the findings, the data is the data. Um, and actually, uh, bear in mind, we weren't talking about bankers. Um, and I think that this, it's a sort of mistake sometimes to conflate all highly paid people as having the same set of behaviors and the same set of values. So this is very specifically the, the kind of people that run companies, CEOs and very senior executives. Um, we thought about you know, how you pose the question um, uh, and we very consciously tried to make them think hard about this question um, by using Rawls's thought experiment. So we tried to uh, make them think what it would be like if they weren't who they were, um, and they could be anybody in society. Uh, in those circumstances, what principles of distributed justice would be right? Um, anecdotally, I, I subsequently uh, met some of these people. I mean, I, I didn't know who they were, but they came up to me and said, I've done your survey. Um, and uh, at, you know, anecdotally, um, they said they spent time on it and they'd really engaged with it and they found it interesting and challenging and it had really make, make, made them think. Um, and on that basis, um, I'm prepared to accept that the data is the data. And, um, you know, um, sure, we can, I mean, one of, you know, one of the, the responses is, well, people will just say what you think they want you to say. But we did try very hard to make that not happen. And, and I guess, you know, the last point here is, so I, I had a career in business before I became an academic. And actually, a kind of 80-20 rule, I think, applied. I mean, yes, sure, there are some greedy people around. Um, but actually, I don't buy the proposition that everybody that works for a big company is uh, greedy and bad. Um, I think most people are actually try to be good people, um, and there are some exceptions. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's the best you're going to get. <laughs> I was we can come back to some of that in the Q and A. So Catherine, um, given that you're a journalist, what's the business perspective on Sandy's remarks? Um, so do you think companies and investors can really be expected? to think about executive pay through an ethical lens? Um, yes, I really think they can be expected to think about executive pay through an ethical lens. Um, I mean, it doesn't always work, of course, or their motivations might not be pure, but um, certainly over time, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, there was far less disclosure about pay. Um, I remember writing stories about the fact that senior executives when they were fired would get golden parachutes maybe two or three years money if they were being if they were being fired these things have very largely gone away in the uk so there's been a real shift and i certainly think the financial crisis which does relate to banks but i think had a had a wider effect made companies realize much more than they had done in the past that they were 
part of society and had a had a wider range of stakeholders and covid has has um increased that notion and certainly we saw senior executives um not taking bonuses or taking pay cuts during covid um what we also saw of course is after covid them saying well i definitely need a bit more money because i had to really rough it in the period of covid which isn't necessarily what people expected them to do perhaps but i think certainly there's a there's a keener a keener sense of image that companies have and that relates to climate and it relates to social interaction and it does relate to pay as well and so i think that um companies would have to be crazy not to take um a rigorous sensible approach to pay i mean what that, that actually results in of course is quite subjective but um it's it's clearly the way good companies are going thank you catherine so alex as a philosopher who typically favors analytical reasoning and thought experiments i'd be interested in your views on sandy's approach of using empirical work to develop ideas about executive pay and distributive justice so what would you add to the analysis so you already said you would have asked the question a bit differently anything else um just to clarify i'm, I'm not no, i'm not saying necessarily that the the data is not revealing of people's uh, sense of justice but rather that one step uh, for me would give more clarity on that which is did people endorse the thought experiment as a good one for eliciting principles of justice because of course that's a matter of dispute it, it obviously one of one reason that people do like it is because it's clearly impartial in the manner that you indicated right imagine you're not yourself your principles of justice are meant to be for the whole society not partial to you we know we're all subject to partiality so there's it has a lot to recommend it perhaps in, in further comments you could say maybe in the transcript of or or where people had so to speak free comments they they said something about whether they endorsed the thought experiment or not then on to what we learn from this as philosophers so one thing, I mean, there are many things we can learn. I think one thing we learned that, it, what I learned from it is that um, accepting Sandy's view, which I, I, I would think is correct, that uh, executives are not motivated solely by self-interest, but also by what Rawls called the sense of justice. We learn how to speak to their sense of justice because we learn what it involves. So Rawls understood a sense of justice as a, a willingness to propose to others fair terms of social cooperation and a willingness to discuss them with others, as to say, not take your own first thoughts as the last word on the matter. And in addition, to abide by them if you think others will do so too. Notice that conditional claim. So what could we learn from Sandy's research here is that it's not um, a fool's errand to appeal to the sense of justice of uh, chief executives, but that we'd have to do so in the service of social norm change or regulatory change that will affect all of them in the field rather than appeal to them individually in the midst of a process in which everyone is filling their pockets and their pay packet is a symbol of their relative standing in the field. We'd have to appeal to their, uh, their willingness to join in or not resist, or join others in proposing reforms that would make for more equitable pay. That's what one important thing that I learned from Sandy's empirical work. Thank you, Alex. So Eva is um, somebody who's dealing a lot with law and teaches law. When it comes to executive pay, um, UK company <coughs> law relies on aligning the interests of shareholders and executives. So Sandy's described executive pay in terms of a market failure, and specifically talking about ELTA. What do you think about this from a lawyer's perspective? Yes, yeah, so, so <clears throat> from a lawyer's perspective, I would, I would slightly rephrase your question. And I would say um, the law doesn't buy into this idea of aligning shareholders with directors. Um, 
or hasn't done so since the financial crisis. What the law has bought into, and not really the law, but the corporate governance code, it has bought into the idea that executive remuneration is a governance tool. And I would say all was well until the 1980s, which your chart also shows. And then what creeps into a corporate governance discussion is this idea, we connect pay to um, the directors doing something that enhances the value of the business ultimately for the shareholders. And then pay becomes something that achieves an aim outside of rewarding the directors. And then we all of a sudden have a justification for high awards. It isn't just the directors lining their pockets. It is something that achieves something also for something else. And until the financial crisis, that was the business shareholder value. And then since the financial crisis, we have changed that other objective into being the purpose of the corporation, the long-term sustainability of the corporation. And that's reflected in the Corporate Governance Code 2018. But what, what that mechanism suffers from is that we don't, or at least that's the perspective of a legal mind, that we don't know very well on how to define now what a good result will be in the future. And we haven't achieved that, it looks like, for financial return. So it's not very easy to say now, you know, what is the benchmark against performance? We will make against we will we will, against which we will measure performance in the future. So that's not something we can do, haven't managed. And I think it's almost a natural experiment that we have seen since the 1980s. We haven't done that well. We continue to use that mechanism, and now we are asking remuneration packages to do the additional difficult job of defining targets that help purpose and long-term sustainability. And I think that is something, that idea that has found its way into the code um, is a motor for increasing remuneration because we don't have adequate benchmarks, and we justify high remuneration by these other aims. And that then brings remuneration up and up and up. Um, and I also think the disclosure rules that, that you mentioned earlier have also become a motor for telling everyone how much everyone else makes. So you then look at what everyone else makes and definitely you don't wanna be paid below that. So it then becomes the food that feeds this arms race of remuneration going up and up and up. Um, so I think these are regulatory legal interventions that have had unintended consequences. Hmm. Well, thank you. And um, definitely being um, either the chair or member of the remuneration committee, and there I think are some people here in the audience from a non-executive director's perspective, has become quite a hot seat and also mm -hmm. quite often, and I think you talk about that in your book, Sandy, um, whether it's activist investors, institutional investors, obviously the lines get blurred a bit, have actually focused quite a bit on executive pay. So let me just ask one more question sort of just um, to the panel as a whole before we open up for questions. So come think about your questions both online and in the room. So, so two things combined. So how concerned should we be about income inequality? So thinking back to Sandy's you know, first par um, graph where it showed difference between how it was in the UK and in the US. And then are pay ratios a helpful way of thinking about the relationship between executive pay and average pay levels? So uh, just also thinking about how this actually shone a light during the pandemic. I mean, when actually certainly many companies suddenly thought about what does an average person in my company mark make vis-a-vis -vis the CEO or the CFO or others on the management committee? So I, Can I comment I first? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, the pay ratios, I, I think, are helpful. Um, the, there's this issue about the, the, the technicalities of how you calculate them. Um, the US does it one way. The UK does it a different way. I'm not sure either is the right way. Um, I think there's a lot more technical work to be done to find the best way of um, calculating and disclosing ratios. But I think it does help. And, and you know, the statistics are quite stark in that respect. Mm 
Um, and uh, so I, I would hope it, it, it might be one of the, 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 um, uh, the, the kind of regulatory things that is a helpful one rather than an unhelpful one. I, I entirely agree with what Eva just said. I, I remember um, uh, speaking to um, the chair of the remuneration committee back in, I guess, sort of the early 1990s when the disclosure rules were uh, extended. Um, and he said, you, you know, this is going to do completely the opposite of what the government is hoping it's going to do and uh, prove to be wrong. Catherine, from um, any perspective from your side on um, how concerned should we be? And our pay ratios helpful? Yeah, I don't know. I think pay ratios have to be helpful. I'm, and I completely agree with you about the sort of impact that disclosure has had, but I also think that disclosure is a good thing. Um, I think in publicly listed companies, it is pretty important to have that transparency of um, executive pay. Um, my feeling would be on that, that there has to be a different way to look at this sort of ever upward spiral. Um, and I know you're not saying this, but I, I don't think taking away disclosure would be a good thing. I mean, my broad feeling is on the ratios point. So, I mean, some sectors obviously have um, um, more discrepancy than others, but I broadly think it's it's a sign of a fairly functional company within its sector. If that ratio is, is on the slightly better end than on the worse end, I think there are valid reasons for why there is that discrepancy. So I, I, I think it's important to look at it. Eva, any yeah, so I'm, 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 I would, I'm optimistic about pay ratios having an effect. Um, I would be worried about the methodology as, as Sandy has said. Um, so there is a question of how easy is this to manipulate? Um, and, and there is a risk that as soon as we focus on particular individual indicators there's a lot of complexity that we lose um, and may end up in a place where um, you know a lot of work is outsourced um, which tends to have an effect of um, reducing the remuneration of the employees of the outsourced company so I think there are lo there's lots of work that will have to be done on methodology thank you finally Alex so I think pay ratios are are good as a very rough indicator of one small dimension of inequality. Fundamentally, of course, what matters is the full distribution of income and wealth and also what income and wealth you, what you can buy with them and whether there are non-market provided goods like healthcare for which you do not need income and, and you are given access to them or not. So of course, the true picture of inequality and especially how the bottom 20%, I would say, fares is much more complex than these ratios. But one thing that these ratios indicate, ratio of pay between a CEO and say the average worker or the least paid worker in the firm, is it's something people immediately understand. And so it's a way in to a conception of, to a discussion about justice and inequality, which of course then has to broaden out and include um, everyone in society. And why we should care about such inequalities, I would say in a nutshell, two things. One is distributive fairness. To a large extent, our economic rewards are simply down to brute luck. Of course, there's an element of choice, but a very, very large extent <clears throat> involves simply good fortune. And that means that, that good fortune, I think, should be up for redistribution among, out of solidarity. The second thing is our relationships. So when there's very large inequalities, especially when those at the bottom lead a precarious existence, uh, this is ripe for power imbalances, for domination, for marginalization of the less well off. And these are problematic relationships that we have to overcome if we want a genuinely cooperative society, also within a firm. So firms or corporations can be, in a sense, a mini society where people have to have a sense of they're working together towards a common goal. And I think pay disparities matter for that as well. Right. Well, thank you. And obviously, as Sandy, you put in your book, this also varies um, from country and region to others, right? Scandinavia is one country where actually there has been broader redistribution. So let's move to the Q&A. So we'll start um, in the room. 
And so I can see hands going up already. So please be concise when posing the questions. If you're online, please post a question. Somebody from the events team will collate them and read them out. And then when um, asking a question, could you please state your name and affiliation to the LSE and your geographic location if you're online? So let's start here. Um, this is the person here with a white shirt. And then we'll go, there's somebody in the green jumper. We'll take one here on the right, very right hand side. Sandy, um, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd, I'd like to be provocative though, um, and suggest that what you describe um, as a market failure could be looked at as a well-functioning market. And what you describe as a well-functioning market might be looked at as a market failure. Um, so you, you seem to suggest that a well-functioning market is one where all in companies offer their CEOs roughly the same amount with nobody breaking ranks. And that sounds awfully like a cartel, which Joseph Heath would certainly describe as a market failure. Um, equally, you, you describe as a market failure where a company steps out and pays a premium for what it perceives to be a higher quality resource, which sounds awfully like a well-functioning market to me. Um, sorry, I should have added, it's, it's Charles Sherwood at the LSE. And I think when we move to the next person there in the middle and the green jumper. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Santiago and uh, I'm not affiliated with uh, LSE. I'm uh, uh, from Oxford, uh, from the Masters of Public Policy program. And uh, my question is, um, it's uh, very interesting, the analysis you make on uh, the way you uh, establish that uh, it is a market failure which needs to be regulated uh, by uh, some um, uh, incentive from the government but uh, and, and from other uh, kind of uh, different actors. But uh, how much uh, would you think it's also kind of a cultural uh, uh, pro problem from uh, kind of the structure, the, 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 the societal structure that uh, we, we have developed right now in which uh, the accumulation of capital has become more uh, 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 of an end rather than, than, than a means of achieving things. So uh, that's my question, thank you. Thank you. And then there was a question here on the right. Thank you. Yeah, I think the microphone is just coming. Thank you. We'll go online next. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Daniel Beunza, and I am uh, professor of uh, social studies of finance at uh, Bayes Business School. Um, so, uh, Sandy, this is a wonderful talk, and, and reminds me of our many conversations here, um, trying to puzzle out uh, capitalism in the aftermath of the uh, uh, global financial crisis. And I think that your account of executive pay based on isomorphism has the advantage that it explains this um, puzzle that you confronted, which is such levels of high pay, um, and at the same time, senior managers that seem to be um, ethical and concerned about fairness. The challenge that I find is, um, does it to what extent does it, do you think it explains uh, the data that you presented? Because you're showing us differences in um, high levels of pay between countries and over time. Um, are you implying that the levels of isomorphism um, explain those differences? Meaning, do, is it that some countries rely more than others on the advice of experts, best practice, etc.? Or on the other hand, are there other reasons that would explain those differences? Thank you. Sandy, do you want to start and then to the extent others on the panel? Yeah, so um, so thank you for those questions. Um, all good questions. Let me start uh, with Charles's question. Um, I, I, I think the particular sort of phrase you picked up was when I was talking about what I call the remuneration committee's dilemma, um, which is another of these kind of thought experiments. So you have to have a starting point and the starting point there would be what happens if, if you take um, the FTSE 100, let's say, you know, there's not huge differentials between different people other than 
uh, by reasons of industry or, or sort of other explainable factors. So I'm, I'm certainly not saying everybody should be paid the same. I'm trying to explain um, how, um, what, what, why it is that inflation in pay has occurred. Um, and I'm arguing that effectively there is a prisoner's dilemma and it, it kind of, everyone is um, given a, uh, I mean, ration, thinking rationally, they pay more than they, um, they would be happy to pay because of the situation that they're in. Um, I, it is not my thesis that everybody should be paid the same. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating a kind of Cuban society where doctors and taxi drivers are all equally badly paid. Um, I, you know, differentials, um, I think, are um, an inevitable part of a healthy economic system. Um, but, I, but I do believe that the level of differential that has crept into uh, the pay of super managers compared with uh, the average over the last 30 years is not justifiable. Um, and is, you know, I'm saying a market failure in kind of economic terms. Um, the, the, the sort of cultural issues. Um, uh, it, one of the interesting things about our data was that we, we, tried, we tried to analyze to see whether there were um, differences in the data that could be attributed to uh, ethnic dif uh, differences, you know, uh, nationalities and so forth. And one of the things that we tried to do at one point um, was uh, correlate our answers with uh, the Hofstetter data that you may be familiar with. And we could find no correlations. Um, so in our particular data set, it seemed that this particular sort of strip of society that we were talking about was not apparently significantly affected by um, by uh, sort of uh, differences of nationality. Um, to put it an, in, an, in a different way, a super manager in Germany and a super manager in America and a super manager in the UK kind of think the same or think, think more similarly than they might do um, with others in their particular national um, setting. Um, and then um, uh, Daniel's question, um, uh, the, the, the question about why, if there's isomorphism, are there still these sort of differences in pay practices between different countries? Um, that's a very good question. I'm not entirely sure I know the answer. Um, I, I think, I mean, part of it will be to do with um, the kind of the different legal regimes and governance regimes and that sort of thing. And it, and it, it may well be that in an attempt to solve problems in the UK and America, actually the, the provision of vast amounts of data compared with um, what's happened in other countries has actually accelerated pay inflation rather than had its desired effect. Um, and as other companies, other countries rather copy Anglo-Saxon corporate governance practices, um, what I think you see is um, a, a similar kind of inflation beginning to occur in, in other countries too. So um, it would be quite interesting. There you go, Daniel, there's a research project that, uh, that somebody could do at some point. Thank you. So let's go actually online now, Alice. I think you've um, coll collated a few questions. Thank you. Yes, I'll do the first three online. Um, first one is from Benjamin Green, and he asked, how is this different from any other labour market? Um, if tech firms could coordinate to reduce salaries for software engineers, they would be better off, but they can't, so they must pay high salaries, to not risk being stuck with poor performers. The second question I have is from Judy Gore at Birkbeck, who I think is a co-author and friend. The question is, where does Professor Pepper fit within the four clusters and how might this affect the narrative and conclusions? <laughs> Putting on the spot. And the third mm -hmm. question I have is from Tyler Kojic in New York. And the question is, if investors have a role to play in this ethical framework, are there practical changes that can be made to stock markets to encourage this desired behavior? Are there any existing mechanisms to do this? Great. I have a few Thank more questions. You. Easy one, it's fine. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get all the questions if I'm not careful, aren't I? Yes. Um, the, 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 
so all labour markets are peculiar. Um, uh, it's not just senior executive labour markets that um, uh, that are sort of problematic in economic terms. Um, so you know this lovely phrase. Well, I think it's a lovely phrase. Uh, labour markets. Labour is not a commodity like fish. Um, you know we're all different. Um, however, the difference between what I'm talking about and say the market for engineers or the market for, um, uh, I don't know, um, what would be another, I mean, sort of um, people with uh, tech expertise or something is, there's just a lot more people around. Um, but th there's only a relatively small number of people who have the capabilities to be the CEO of a FTSE 100 company. So we're talking about small number situations where, um, you know, I think an economist would accept that actually you don't necessarily get efficient outcomes. So it's just it's just a kind of consequence of the um, the, the limited number of people in the market. But nevertheless, um, this issue about the way that labour markets operate compared with other commodity markets, the market for fish, there's all sorts of um, institutions and things that creep in that mean that the markets don't necessarily operate in the way that um, a, a market in a sort of economics 101 um, class would suggest that they should. Um, Julie Gore's question. Yes, Julie Gore was my supervisor when I did my uh, doctorate. So uh, <laughs> yeah, she's entitled to ask a difficult question. Um, I, I suppose I'm a welfare liberal. Um, uh, you know, I, I do believe in the, um, the I, I believe in free markets, I believe in the capitalist system, uh, but I also believe in social justice and that everybody has the right to, um, uh, to sufficient income to lead a dignified life. So I think probably in terms of my four clusters, I didn't answer the questions, but that's probably where I would sit. Um, I didn't quite catch the last question, so... Um, why doesn't one of the other panel ask that? <laughs> Did any other, no, anyone else get no. it? Uh, it was about if there's um, any existing mechanisms in the stock market that can encourage desired behaviour, if investors also have a role in this ethical framework. Oh, OK. Oh. Um, yeah. Investors do have a role. Um, another part of my thinking um, is, um, is that there is a collective action problem when it comes to investors. So, so governments have said for quite a long time, particularly the UK government has said, you know, this is not, not, not the government, this is an issue for um, the shareholders to sort out with the companies um, in, in which they own shares. Um, the problem is if, you're, um, if you are an institutional investor, um, uh, maybe you have at most two or three percent of the shares of a, of a listed company um, uh, under your control. Um, uh, maybe you're a uh, managing a what a sort of 50 billion fund. You know, to be honest, if the if the CEO is paid a couple of million more than he or she should be, um, and your interest in that is two or three percent. You kind of not bothered particularly. Um, so the collective action problem is it's only if institutional investors kind of all get together and sense they have obligations that they um, uh, that they feel that there's uh, you know that they need to do something about it. Now I think that has changed in the last few years, and um, there are certain uh, investors like uh, the Norges, Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund that are certainly taking. Uh, executive pay seriously, but historically, I don't think that has been one of their priorities. And, and it, it kind of, I mean, just to pick up one of the things that we're talking about, I, I, I think what I have come to realize over the course of many years thinking about this from lots of different perspectives is that, uh, you know, there, there, there isn't ultimately a legal solution or an economic solution or, you, you know, there aren't technical solutions to the, to the kind of problems that we're talking about, which is why I kind of come back to actually ultimately it's an ethical uh, issue. Um, and yes, we need sort of technical devices and so forth uh, to help influence and affect behaviour. Uh, but ultimately, it, it, you know, it comes, it comes down to people's 
virtue and their uh, um, and their ethical behaviours. Well, in addition to investors, obviously proxy advisors have also taken um, quite a interest in this. So one final round in the room. So um, let's go um, there um, on the left, um, just halfway up in black. Yeah, here, yeah, stop, yeah, that's right. And then we'll go to the other side of the room, perhaps at the back. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, my name is Deborah Gilsh and I don't have any affiliation to the LSC, uh, but my background is in institutional investment and I've spent a lot of time engaging um, with companies on remuneration. Um, I think your work, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Pepper, is particularly important because it gives voice to CEOs on this subject and we've heard actually very few CEOs talking publicly about CEO pay. Um, there's been a few, including Jerome van der Veer, the ex-CEO of Shell, who said in 2008 that if you'd paid him 50% more, he wouldn't have done it any better. And if you'd paid him 50% less, you wouldn't, he wouldn't have done it any worse. And so um, I'm really interested in some of the evidence from the super managers that you interviewed around, I guess, the intangible assets of being a CEO, because it isn't just about remuneration. And actually, if it's only about remuneration, you have a different governance problem. There's huge privilege in being the CEO of a public company. Um, it sets you up to go on to other you know, amazing opportunities as well. And I just wonder whether any of the narrative from the people that you interviewed, whether that was acknowledged as well, that there are, there are kind of intangible, intangible benefits that you can't put monetary amounts onto, but actually, they're probably even more highly paid than we think they are if we take just um, if we don't just look at monetary amounts. Thank you, um, Deborah. And then right at the uh, at the back there. Um, the... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this might be an extreme example, but uh, the, the the man who's paid the most on the planet has only been uh, running a profitable company for two years now. So uh, the, the system is definitely broken, um, and there are many examples like that. Uh, your, your analysis looked at um, the FTSE 100, but if you look at the NASDAQ, it's, I mean, I'm, everybody knows it's much worse. Um, what can we do? I mean, I, I actually think it's, you know, it's companies that don't make a profit and pay their CEOs as much as they do is a huge problem. It's, it's, in, it's in our face. It's happening all the time tech companies get away with it. We've recently had uh, another case of Brian Armstrong of Coinbase, uh, you know, 10th most uh, paid, most, most well-paid CEO on the planet and uh, look at what, you know, what's, what's come of his company. So is there a collusion around share price or are we really forgetting to do fundamental sort of financial performance analysis? And do Remco's really need to uh, up their game because I, I don't think actually the, the pay ratio is really uh, as as transparent it needs to be about options and stock option awards. Thanks. Thank you. Would you mind just adding your affiliation? Sorry, uh, Ami Kotecha. Uh, I'm an LSE alum, alumna. Thank you. Um, and then here at the front, last question. Uh, thanks very much, Ewan McGahey, King's College London Law School, and I used to be a graduate student here. Um, thanks very much for a great talk, Sandy. Um, on the concept of market failure, um, th there's also some more thinking from the legal side about what market failures are, and uh, the basic idea is that they don't really exist. So somebody like Katharina Pistor in Columbia University would say, and I think she's right, that uh, markets are really constructed by law. Uh, markets are created by contract law, property law, uh, corporations, tort law. Um, and, and so really there's no such thing as a market failure. Uh, it's just different kinds of legal arrangements which produce outcomes that we do uh, or don't like. Uh, you have contract law, corporations construction one way, you're going to get one set of economic outcomes, you construct them another way, you're going to get another set. Uh, and so uh, uh, granted that there's a lot of uh, different components to the rise in executive pay, uh, one of the reasons that we saw, or one of the um, co uh, points at which executive pay started soaring uh, was with legal change. So in 1969, Delaware changed its law so that uh, it wasn't the company constitution that set pay or shareholders, uh, and then pay started going up exponentially. Uh, 
1980s in the United Kingdom, same thing happened. And also institutional investors, asset managers and banks start voting on everyone's pay. But also when pay came down over the New Deal uh, and post-war period, there was the salary stabilization unit in the States. You know, all of these were legal uh, issues. So uh, if you want to change things, surely there is a legal solution and that's uh, that you have fair pay scales right across the board even within pay ratios, decided by all of the real investors, not just the city of Wall Street, and the workforce as a whole. And then surely everyone's ethics would count. Thank you. Can I ask Eva to perhaps take the legal side? Well, I'd, I'd, let, let me make a couple of comments, and then I'm going to introduce Eva to the discussion for the last question. Um, if you don't mind. Sorry, you're the chair. Um, <laughs> right. um, th this point about being a CEO, actually, uh, it's quite interesting. Some earlier research I did um, some years ago um, where we interviewed CEOs and sort of very senior executives and asked them about motivation. Um, their motivation was rarely about money, actually. Um, th these are people who, in the main, to get where they've got to, are driven by a wish to achieve things um, uh, and um, uh, you know so that they have very strong intrinsic motivation um, and if that's a kind of um, uh, if that constitutes an asset from the the status that they receive uh, you know I mean maybe it does but I mean it, it was kind of interesting uh, in talking to them how actually few of them talked about being driven by money money was sort of something that happened but it wasn't necessarily something that um, that caused them to do the things that they uh, uh, they uh, that they set out to do, um, uh, uh, you know. And I uh, and I hear the sort of the the the, the strongly uh, put cry from the back about where it all really goes wrong. Um, and I guess you know the the sort of things that that I have been looking at are not those situations in the main. Um, but I, I, I think my comment would be. Um, uh, unless actually there's a kind of stronger ethical core in the sort of heart of most business, then inevitably you're going to get these sort of um, uh, some of the sort of uh, consequences at the extreme that are particularly undesirable. And then this really interesting question. Um, so it, it, it Eva and I have a project um, that I'm due to start and I haven't done it yet, which is actually to think about the consequences of, of uh, these ideas for uh, for the legal framework, um, and th there's a kind of interesting chicken and egg knocking around here, isn't it? Is is do the economics and the business practices bring about the legal framework, or does the legal framework bring about the economics and the uh, and the and the uh, the business practices, or is it somehow iterative and it all goes round in a circle? But I think. And this is where I'm going to pass on to Eva. I mean, I think Eva would say actually that the the current sort of legal framework in the in the in the UK and Delaware and that sort of thing is predicated upon an old-fashioned, well, what I regard as an old-fashioned model. And actually, if you change the model, that can have uh, that could have a positive impact on outcomes. But Eva, I must defer yes. to you. So, so in response to your question, um, I agree with. Katarina Pisto's point that law plays a role in outcomes. Um, I, I don't, but I don't think you say that. I wouldn't say change the law, the outcome would be different. That would be wonderful and easy. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way. Because, because you know, as you say, that so what we have in the law was a reflection of an idea that rooted itself in society. So this idea of you know making pay performance related. Uh, creating incentives for performance that's something that's that was a sort of societal inter intervention starting in the 1980s and we're kind of seeing the problems that came with that um, but in your recommendation of course pay decisions um, the base committee of the house of commons um, discussed ideas such as putting employees on remuneration committees to bring in somebody into the decision making who represents the employees, um, which is much better than ratios because those can be manipulated. Um, the idea of saying, you know, remuneration should be sat with a contribution from 
the employees. Um, or another example is simplifying remuneration. So one big problem in remuneration is we do need consultants to tell us what the number, the numerical outcome is of a pay package. So contracts have become so complex. Um, and, and I wonder if that isn't a way of masking outcomes. So we are finding ever more complex methodologies to justify high pay um, so that the legal reaction is, whatever you do, disclose one number. Um, so, so I think there is a, there is, there is, there are things that the law can do, uh, but I don't think there's a sort of on and off switch here to say we change the law, a presto, problem will be solved. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Thank you. So, one final quick fire from me for each of you. What's the one thing you would change? But literally one one word or one sentence at most, and then we'll close up. So Catherine, one thing. Um, I do think there's massive market failure. And so I would change companies' whole approach to talent. So they have a bigger group of people from whom to choose. Catherine. Oh, sorry, Eva. Eva I, I would remove the idea that pay can be made performance related. Okay. All right. I'm quite attracted to the idea that pay for senior executives has to be justified to the workforce in the firms. And so some degree of worker representation on uh, remuneration setting panels sounds very attractive to me. Obviously, it's happening already in other regions, right? Continental Europe, yep. for example. Sandy, finally. Uh, gosh, a difficult question. I would get rid of long-term incentive plans. I would ban them and say that, <laughs> that, um, that executives should be uh, predominantly paid in cash and they should be required to invest some of their cash in shares and in that way align their interests with shareholders. But these rinky-dink plans that uh, were supposed to make people perform better, I think, have, have, uh, have not been the right thing. Right. Well, thank you. Um, well, for a really rich and very lively discussion and um, would have loved to continue um, with so many questions. I'm sure there were lots of questions online. So let me just uh, really firstly thank Catherine, Eva, Alex and Sandy for um, you know, all their remarks. And let me thank all of you for coming along in person on a rainy day and also all of those and joining online and uh, posing all this question. So it's really good to know that the majority of these executives do not act entirely in their self-interest. And thank you for um, your work. Um, um, and uh, it was eye-opening to hear the panel's perspective from a business, legal and philosophical viewpoint. So um, in, I'm intrigued by thoughts on what can be done to solve market failure and I imagine this work will be something Sandy and others will continue to look into in the future and just to finish off I can attest it is a really well worth easy read much less heavy than the Thomas Piketty book much <laughs> so um, I think there are copies outside there Sandy copies will outside. stay behind to sign copies makes an excellent um, end of year present <laughs> for teachers, friends, family. Um, and thank you all for coming along Great and ladies. for joining in this. <laughs>